Thank you for joining us today for this year's Martin Luther King Jr. holiday celebration. Now, we would like nothing more than to have you here on the campus of the National Civil Rights Museum. But alas, 2021 is not going to allow us to do that due to the COVID-19 virus. But we are promising you that what we are going to bring to you today is going to be just as energizing, just as informative as if you were here on our campus. This year would be Dr. King's 92nd birthday. And because we are doing this virtually, we thought that we would let you in behind the scenes to talk to people who typically work here at the National Civil Rights Museum as volunteers on our King holiday celebration. We also are gonna just talk about birthdays and Dr. King's birthday and how they celebrated birthdays with Dr. King. We also think that this year it's really important that you learn a little bit more about Mrs. Coretta Scott King's involvement in the creation of Dr. King's 
birthday holiday celebration, as well as the fact that Mrs. King really has been the one who has created the legacy of Dr. King. So please, enjoy the programming that we have for you today. I'm certain that you will learn something that you didn't know, but you will also have the opportunity to enjoy some of that entertainment that you're used to receiving here when you're on the campus. Thanks again for joining us and happy King Day. So Martin Luther King was born in uh, Jim Crow, Georgia, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, to be particular. So he was a child of segregation, uh, but he was also a child of unique privilege in the sense that he was born to one of the black elite, black middle uh, class families at the time, born right there on Auburn Avenue. So while he was subject uh, to the restrictions of segregation, he couldn't go to uh, the lunch counter at a Rich's department store, if you will, uh, he also was able, because of his parents' um, uh, occupation, his father was a preacher, his grandfather was a preacher at middle class status, to be sheltered to a certain extent uh, from the harshest aspects of segregation. But he still saw them. He was still well aware. And he was also, he also came of age during the Great Depression. And so he saw how capitalism, the economic system, uh, really failed uh, not only African Americans, but all. Uh, Americans to a certain extent, uh, which informed the critique that he would have of the American economic system later in life.
you know, in King Day, it's January, uh, it's cold, uh, sometimes it's very rainy. Uh, I would just say a, a few years ago, uh, it was very interesting. I mean, it was freezing out there, but it was just a, amazing to see the amount of people that lined up to come in to, to, to see uh, the museum. Uh, amazing to see the amount of volunteers that showed up in spite of the weather, um, ready to work. Uh, it was just an, an amazing item. To, um, to be a, a part of. So I, I just think um, there have been several instances like that, but of course that one was just recent. Uh, I wanna say it's like 2017 and 2016, but oh man, it was freezing out there and it's raining and you know, and, and we still were able to put on a great show. The show went on and and, and people loved it. So I, for me, that was a, a great experience. Martin Luther King, as a student, uh, was brilliant. Uh, he was smart. Uh, he did well, particularly in his uh, younger years. There are surviving essays and public speeches uh, that he did. Uh, and so he was, even at a young age, showed a, a real dynamism for, for oratory. 
Uh, he enrolled at Morehouse College uh, at the tender age of 15 and would spend four years there before graduating. And so uh, he, was, he was definitely um, a, a smart, uh, precocious, uh, but he also at Morehouse College was like, yeah, I'm good. Let's figure out what else is going on in this world. And, and so he was sort of an average student at Morehouse, uh, but he was also the mentee of the president of Morehouse College, Benjamin Elijah Mays. And so while he was kind of coming to his own, spreading his wings out from under his father's uh, uh, close watch while in college and kind of drifted with the studies a little bit, uh, the foundation uh, was there and his intellect and his insight and his observational ability, his analysis was already in place. And so when he graduated from Morehouse and then uh, would eventually head to Pennsylvania and then uh, Boston uh, to receive his advanced degrees, he was well prepared uh, for the work ahead. I started out with King Day. And once I started out volunteering at the museum, I wanted to get my daughter involved. So I started her volunteering when she was in high school in 2013 so that she could get that opportunity and that experience to know what it was to give back um, in the community. And that's what we've been doing since then. We've been volunteering at the National Civil Rights Museum. Cause we live into America's Just look all around ya I mean we tired of waiting When will our freedom ring? Let it be known when you call Martin That they shot Dr. King You see they were standing up by sitting down And our resistance getting stronger Running tail to town Our heads barely above water But we'll never drown You hear us coming That's the movement Yeah I love the sound Okay so help together Right now Over me King's Christian beliefs evolve over time, uh, but where he lands, where he settles, 
is, is, is with the social gospel. Um, this idea that his Christian witness uh, really was connected to uh, being a servant of the Lord uh, in the tradition of Daniel. Uh, and, and being a servant of the Lord meant serving people. Uh, and so he did, did not uh, limit his Christian ministry uh, solely to the gospel. Uh, he believed that you had to practice the gospel uh, by doing good works for the least among us. And that meant uh, working to end poverty, uh, working to uh, extend uh, basic civil rights and hum human rights to African-Americans. So there was a line between his civil rights activism and his Christian ministry, uh, but, that, but both informed the other. Uh, and it was not a hard and fast line in which the two were separate. This, that's very important to me. It's a symbol of my history, our history, American history. I volunteer for King Day because it is a way for me to give forward, to pay it forward, to pass it on, and to give of myself to the community, as well as share what I have to others. What we have, this history of the museum is so important. So by volunteering there, it allows me to be a part of history while as absorbing the past history that we've had. Way, way in the water, way, way. Oh, won't you wait? wait in the water? Come on and wait. wait in the water, children. Wait, wait in the water, cause God's gonna, gonna drop out the water. I stepped in the water and the water was cold. God's gonna, gonna drop out the water. You know it chilled my body and not my soul. God's gonna, gonna drop out the water. Come on and wait. wait in the water. Oh, won't you wait? wait. Oh, won't you wait, wait in the water? Come on and wait, wait in the water, children. Wait, wait in the water, cause God's gonna, gonna jump out the water. I said that God's gonna, gonna jump out the water. You know that God's gonna, gonna jump out the water. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You gotta keep, keep marching. Keep marching on, you gotta keep, keep marching, keep marching on, you gotta keep, keep marching, keep marching on, you gotta keep, keep marching, keep marching on, oh, keep marching on, keep marching on, oh, keep marching on. Keep marching on. How I got over, how I got over, my soul looks back and wonders how I got over. How I got over, how I got over, my soul looks back and wonders how I got over. Dr. King was not born an activist. Uh, he was a reluctant activist, in fact. Uh, his first real foray into activism occurs in 1955 
uh, when he's tapped to serve as the leader of the Montgomery Improvement Association. Uh, but he's a young man at the time, just finishing up his dissertation, comes to Montgomery, Alabama to write his dissertation and finish it, uh, married uh, a newlywed uh, to uh, Coretta Scott King, uh, a new father, um, baby still in diapers, first baby still in diapers. So uh, when the Montgomery bus boycott begins, uh, he is very much, or when Rosa Parks is arrested, uh, he is very much not thinking about leading a life of activism. He's thinking about becoming a preacher uh, and pastor in his first church and all the duties that were uh, that come along with that. Uh, but when Parks is arrested and Edie Nixon and others convene this initial meeting of, uh, of leaders in Montgomery, um, you know, he is tapped. Uh, you know, Edie Nixon and others look to him in particular, uh, in part because he was new. Uh, he, he hadn't been in Montgomery long enough to develop these uh, political loyalties and alliances and allegiances within the uh, black middle class, within the black lead leadership class. Uh, he hadn't been there long enough to be corrupted uh, by uh, white uh, politicians and, and white power brokers. Uh, and he was also young enough uh, to be foolish enough uh, to, take the, to take this leadership role. And that's no small thing as well. But when he was asked, you know, he was like, you know, he almost, you could see him in a chair, right? In the, in, in the back of a meeting hall saying, whoa, whoa, whoa I, didn't, I didn't sign up for this. And, and he asked, you know, essentially he asked for a little time uh, when that initial call is made. Um, and he has to think about it, he has to pray about it. Uh, but he eventually answers the call, much like he answered the call to preach, he answers the call to be an activist. Yeah, I volunteered at the museum because I, I believe in the mission of the museum. Uh, specifically educating and serving as a catalyst to inspire positive change, I think is how the mission statement goes. So I, I believe in that mission. The activities for one are incredible. Uh, music, uh, the food, um, the community engagement, uh, seeing how people interact with them, with each other. Uh, the patience while waiting in the long lines has always kind of inspired me, right? To, to see a, a better side of people.
standing at the fence and then you could walk through but it's only for employees only volunteers only to walk through these access but everyone else that was busy to go around these little kids got off and they were speaking hey how are you doing everything and they were um they was in you know in a moment looking around and saw the sign said we're here y'all we're here and um uh, you know and the kid was like looking at us like we're gonna let us come through i said no young man i said you had to go around that way he said wait a minute you're gonna stop and have me go all the way around so I can get myself educated and go in this building. You gonna make me go the long way, like everyone else? I said, yeah, we have to. And he was like, oh man, I ready to go see it now. I'm like, well, you gotta go around and say, well, sir, thank you, and uh, I appreciate what you're doing. And for a kid to tell me that, appreciate what I'm doing ahead, that lets me know that our future is safe for kids like him that's growing up, and for him wanting to go in. And he said, come on, y'all, let's go this way, cause the big guy. So able to go around for him to have the knowledge, and he's he's only about ten or eleven years, about nine or ten years old. And then have a conversation like that, that was that was really awesome.
last five years of King's life are really critical to understanding King's politics, King's philosophy, uh, his approach to, to social change. It's important that we recognize and acknowledge that King is an evolving thinker. Uh, too often we freeze him on the steps, steps of the Lincoln Memorial uh, during the March on Washington as though that was his first thought and his last thought. Uh, no, that was just a thought uh, in this much longer journey and, and philosophical evolution, in part because after 63, you have so many critical events. Uh, you know, after the March on Washington comes on the heels of the Birmingham campaign, the next year we have St. Augustine campaign that's connected to the Civil Rights Act, Selma in 65. Um, in 66, he's in Chicago expanding and thinking about uh, how to end uh, job uh, housing discrimination and, and segregation uh, in urban centers. Uh, black power drops and we find him in uh, Mississippi with James Meredith and Stokely Carmichael and now he's thinking about uh, supportive of the idea of black political empowerment although he's critical of the particular slogan. And then of course in 67 he, we find him in New York at Riverside uh, Church offering this uh, stinging critique of the Vietnam War and offering uh, a, a, a critique of America pointing out its, its three principal evils, its triple evils of racism, militarism, uh, and capitalism. And, and then of course, finally, we, we find him in the last year of his life in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, working in concert uh, in a support uh, capacity for the, um, the sanitation workers, uh, advocating uh, that all labor had, had dignity uh, and then not getting to live long enough to see his final campaign come into being, which was the Poor People's Campaign, uh, an effort to draw attention uh, to poverty in the nation. So the last five years, the last three to five years of King's life are critical. Uh, and it's important that we uh, take time to study and review them uh, because in those five years is when we see that final blueprint uh, for building a fair and just society, really crystallizing in King's mind uh, and then being offered uh, in his speeches and the final texts that he writes, uh, where do we go from here, chaos or community? My fondest memory would have to be my very first time uh, volunteering for King Day. And I say this because it was the coldest day of the year, I mean, in years, and here I am, but I woke up that morning so excited and so proud to do uh, what I was about to do uh, that I did not even dress appropriately uh, for that day, but that did not damper, that did not damper my uh, enthusiasm. Uh, my first job was actually putting wristbands on people, so I had an outdoor job, but that I was so excited and just to see the, the enjoyment of the people, the spirit, it was just like something was there. And every King Day, it's like that. It's a spirit that you can't even, uh, I mean, imagine. I'll reach that higher 
I volunteer for the museum because it gives me an opportunity to give back to my community and in hopes that it would make a difference to someone. On April 3rd, 1968, King is the most despised person in America. Uh, on April 4th, 1968, he is killed by an assassin. On April 5th, uh, President Lyndon Johnson is coming out and talk singing his praises. And from that moment onward, uh, we will see a reimagining of King in many ways, a uh, building towards and after the King holiday, uh, but, be a, but a reimagining of King that makes him more palatable uh, for many white people in America. Uh, we see it becomes convenient uh, and, and, you know, the, you know, Others have said, you know, dead men make convenient heroes because they're not able to critique the ways in which they're being uh, discussed and framed. Uh, and he becomes this sort of convenient person if we are, for, for Americans and white Americans in particular, uh, when you begin to cherry pick his statements, his philosophy, and suddenly you're able to uh, uphold uh, or, or shine a light on King's I Have a Dream speech focusing only uh, on those four little words, three little words, I have a dream and uh, his, 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 his vision for a society uh, that is colorblind without acknowledging the first half of the speech in which he's saying you can't get to a colorblind society without color conscious policies, that we have to critique police brutality, that we have to uh, uh, provide the resources uh, that are due African Americans for uh, the historic discrimination that they have, that they have faced. So we have created in King uh, this sort of comfortable character uh, that makes us uh, want to pretend as though we have gotten a lot further uh, in this country, in this journey towards a fair and equitable society than we actually have. Uh, that's, a, that's, you know, when, that's a function of favoring nostalgia over history. And we have a, we, we have a fascination with nostalgia, uh, things that make us comfortable uh, you know, in the present, uh, and we still bristle at the hard history of the past. Even though we work all day and we end up being very tired at the end of the day, it is so worthwhile seeing the faces of our guests who come through who've never been to the museum and realize all that the museum has to offer. And I feel like people leave motivated as well. They leave motivated to learn more, to do more, um, and to just be a help in society. My dear fellow clergymen, 
You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. For years now, I have heard the word wait. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see that justice too long delayed is justice denied. The Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. For more than two centuries, our forebears labored in this country without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustice and shameful humiliation. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. Got a huddle, cause everything ain't bad. Sometimes you gotta get in good trouble. Bits and pieces to the puzzle, what a year made it through the rubble. Man, they treat us like a dog, but you never ever put us in a muzzle. Man, they really wanna break us down, they don't understand we can take that. Cause if we lose nine times on the tenth time, still coming right back. You can not erase the history, cause we still gonna get you straight facts. Never ever gonna change, never gonna change. Man, I love being black. Good, good, good Is a threat to justice everywhere So if you see something strange happen Then speak up and like you care We ain't got no other options Time for action, no more watching Ready for the real change So we fight the power, I ain't talking boxing Every single time I promise All they wanna do is tell us what we should've did But when your skin look like mine You already guilty as a little kid I don't know how much more I can take So we gotta break Getting tired of the darkness I can really use a brighter day Everybody knows Coretta Scott King is the central figure, the driving force behind what would become the King holiday. It's important to recognize that Coretta Scott King certainly is the wife of Dr. Martin Luther King, but two things, 
uh, are important to recognize and acknowledge. One, she was an activist in her own right, a, 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 a graduate of Antioch College, which has in, in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which has a radical tradition um, of, of critiquing society. She was uh, a, a trained uh, classical singer who during the movement uh, would contribute in part by having uh, fundraisers, concert fundraisers uh, for the movement. Um, so we see that she as an activist with a clear philosophical vision that wasn't necessarily at odds with King, but in many ways was ahead of him uh, on LGBTQ issues uh, at the time, uh, on the critique of war and, and, and nuclear pr proliferation. These are things that Coretta Scott King had embraced. So she's an activist in her own right, and she's also King's partner. Uh, she's someone that King could talk to, uh, not only about the personal affairs of family, uh, but also about the philosophical things that he was wrestling with. Uh, when his home is first bombed, when their home was first bombed in Montgomery, Alabama in 1956, January 56, uh, you know, King accepts uh, uh, armed self-defense, right? Yeah, yeah, we, a house has been under assault. Yeah, I'm good, brothers. Y'all, <laughs> y'all can hang out. Um, and then after you know a little bit of time, Coretta pulls him aside and is like, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. You know, I believe in nonviolence, and it shouldn't just be a philosophy. It should be a way of life, and we have to practice it and we have to model it. Uh, and and then King, you know, after some prayerful thought, you know, agrees, and 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 then they, you know, sort of part ways with with that armed self defense uh, contingent. Although later on. In places like uh, Mississippi, uh, when brothers like the Deacons of Defense uh, show up in a march, King wasn't. He was like, "Ah, y'all cool, right?" I mean, so he was still, you know, wrestling. But but it just goes to say that you know they were partners, uh, and she, in very in, in, in some instances, is pulling him uh, along in different directions. And so after he dies, uh, she is also the one uh, who 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 uh, preserves is interested in preserving uh, and extending his legacy, even while she was. Uh, he was alive. She was the one uh, who took the initiative to preserve papers, to, to make the documentary record. So she had this vision uh, that, you know, in order to uh, extend their work together, it was important to preserve his work and their work while he was alive. And so she was in a position to immediately uh, begin to build an infrastructure uh, to extend his legacy, that being the uh, Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolence in Atlanta, Georgia. But then a part of extending the legacy was also uh, getting this national holiday, which at the time you think is crazy because I mean, what were you going to get a national holiday for a black person, somebody who just got killed and was the most despised American in the United States? But she was like, no, it's about him, yes, uh, in his name, but it's about what he stood for, what he fought for, and what he died for. And she stayed on that with dogged determination. Uh, for, for almost two decades uh, before we get a decade and a half before we get uh, Ronald Reagan to sign on. Uh, and then the holiday comes into being as a, as a day of service, evolves into a day of service is what it should be uh, to, to promote not just King, but to promote what he stood for uh, and what he died for. It's a team effort. My wife and I both volunteer we decided one day to go down to volunteer for the one shift. And once we got down and enjoyed it, so we continued to volunteer. So we're down there all day. And it gives us an opportunity to work with the museum staff and uh, our leadership team, our volunteer leadership team, and assisting them in getting the visitors to the, uh, to the tour as expeditiously as we can. So when the King holiday comes into being, it's important for us to acknowledge and to recognize that not everybody was on board. Uh, not every state was on board. Uh, Arizona, for example, was one of the states that refused to acknowledge it in any way, shape or form. We are just not gonna acknowledge the King holiday as a holiday at the state level. And you had other states, uh, and principally in the deep South that said, okay, you wanna make it a federal holiday, uh, then we're going to link it up in some way, shape or form uh, with our lost cause legacy, the legacy of white supremacy. We're not going to give you a King holiday uh, without connecting it to this legacy of white supremacy. Uh, and so that's an important aspect of the holiday because 
just like King wasn't embraced by everyone uh, while he was alive, when the holiday comes into being, it's not embraced by everyone. And it reflects the deep white supremacist roots in the mid 1980s uh, that were still with us uh, just 15 or so years after uh, King was killed by an assassin's bullet. It has taken uh, a quarter century uh, for us to, uh, for states, John McCain was the senator of Arizona who voted against it and eventually came around and then decades later uh, for the states to say, you know what, uh, we acknowledge at the state level the importance of this, of this holiday uh, and of King's life and his work, uh, and we stand in support of it. Uh, but, you know, you know, not all movement is forward progress. And so while, you know, for eight years, we saw the president of the United States, Barack Obama and first lady, uh, Michelle Obama, uh, you know, taking the King holiday serious and engaged in acts of service, uh, seeing them with young people, seeing them, uh, you know, in you know, performing acts of service on that day, you know, we spent the last four years uh, looking at a president who could care less uh, about what the holiday, uh, the holiday meant. So. Uh, it is still a, 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 uh, a it's still a contested uh, legacy and still a contested holiday in that sense. Uh, and there's still more work to be done uh, to make sure that everyone appreciates what it is what it's about, just as there's still more work to be done uh, to make sure that everyone appreciates what King was about. I was a volunteer prior to becoming the volunteer manager at the museum since 2009. And actually my first volunteer experience was for King Day. As far as King Day is concerned, it's, it's once again my largest volunteer effort. And it would not be possible without each person donating their time and talent. And we are just so, so grateful for all of the volunteers and all of the sponsors and organizations that come and help us make each King Day a success. And even though it's a virtual King Day, we want to say thank you for your service. And, and if it was not the COVID-19 and we were not virtual, I know that we would have just, you know, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers and thousands of people coming to the museum for King Day. King offers us a living legacy. Uh, what he, his activism uh, left us a blueprint for how to create a fair and just society. And as we move out of uh, 2020 and into 2021, into the third decade of the new century, I think that blueprint is as relevant uh, today as it ever has been. We just have to take the time uh, to study uh, his words and his works and then actualize uh, that roadmap uh, for creating a fair and just society that he left us. You know, it doesn't make much sense
Thank you for joining us for this year's King Day virtual celebration. We hope you learned something, enjoyed the music, or our story time. We hope that we can be together again in 2022. Thank you for supporting the museum in this difficult time, and please remember to donate to us at civilrightsmuseum.org. Yeah, yeah, yeah.